Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, watching throughout the day, um, several major features moving across the United States, including at least two tropical cyclones that we can see here from GOES centered on the United States. So we have Fred, of course, making landfall this afternoon as a strong tropical storm. And then this was Tropical Depression number eight, which has been upgraded to uh, Tropical Storm Henry. And you can see the northern edge of the cloud field here of uh, now Tropical Depression Grace. But as this walk you through late this afternoon, there's a couple other things I'd like to point out. We're going to see a lot of this here in the near term. Scattered convection across parts of the south and some of the storms that are over parts of Arizona, New Mexico, in fact, also uh, Utah and Colorado are producing some flooding conditions. We can again see how uh, widespread the smoke is in parts of the western United States and that's something I'm certainly going to come back to here in a few moments. But as we see this pattern unfold with higher pressure here in the Midwest and drier conditions in the Midwest here in the near term, we want to see how this uh, whole pattern is going to shift and change because right now not only are things changing in the tropics, but they're also changing in the North Pacific jet stream. So let's talk tropics first. So Fred, uh, Henry, and, and Grace. Now Fred, uh, right now at 60 mile an hour, max sustained winds. This puts it at a strong tropical storm here. And we're going to see where it's going to go in a few moments, but uh, Henry was just named late this afternoon uh, after being tropical depression eight, but you can see it got up to 40 mile an hour wind speed. So that crossed that 39 mile an hour threshold. And Grace, while it is still down there below that 39 mile an hour threshold is expected to re-strengthen as it moves toward the Yucatan Peninsula and eventually toward Mexico. So let's take a look at where these things are going. Uh, first, Fred. Now we talked last week about how as Fred was gonna come over Cuba or near Cuba, that there was a, a larger ridge that was in place here that was gonna possibly steer that a little bit farther to the west. And, and uh, it did, it, ju it just went a little bit farther to the west, taking the major flood threat out of much of Florida as we saw that shift over the weekend. But in terms of uh, what Fred will be doing here as it moves toward uh, the northeast eventually, is that it will primarily be a flood threat system. Let's go take a look at it here. So this is kind of zoomed in here uh, on the southeast uh, through the mid-Atlantic. And we're going to watch as the European model accumulates rainfall here through Wednesday and getting out to Thursday. Let's just stop it here uh, early in the morning on Friday. So the European model right now has a pretty narrow corridor in through here where the possibility of getting better than two inches of rain is relatively high. There will be places along uh, Fred's track and really just to the east of the track, aided by the Appalachian Mountains, where we could have between two and maybe upwards of six to maybe 10 inches of rainfall in some locations. So right in through this area, hitting the Cotton Belt pretty hard here, then coming up through the Appalachian Mountains, and then getting here between Virginia and West Virginia. And that is a place where we saw a lot of drought developing in July and early August. So we're gonna keep a close eye on that. Uh, the wind threat with this particular system, we can see it here. This is the extent uh, of tropical storm force winds given in a probability. So pretty high right here. And this is almost at the same place where um, category five strength Hurricane Michael hit a few years ago, but this is nowhere close to what that system did. And uh, we won't probably be able to get winds above about 50 miles an hour into Alabama or Georgia out of this. So I'm not expecting a lot of wind damage. This is primarily going to be a flooding event as it passes on through. Now, what about Grace? Uh, interestingly enough, we, we continue to see Grace's track shoving to the west very quickly. That's a steering current and staying pretty far to the south, coming right in through here, the Bay of Campeche. And where it eventually uh, hits either Central or, or North America is still, um, we're several days out from when this could possibly be here. Maybe by the end of the week, we'll have a better handle on where it could be. But just wanna make a note that uh, of a couple things. The, the, this particular region as of late has not been overly sheared and the ocean temperatures are relatively warm, which means it could very well strengthen quickly in this area. Although right now the National Hurricane Center doesn't bring Grace's strength above tropical storm strength before it hits either uh, the Yucatan or this section of Mexico or even into Southern Texas where it could produce quite a bit of flooding rain. And uh, the newly updated um, Tropical Storm Henry forecast track has kind of loop around Bermuda make its way toward the U.S., but it will be carried out and hopefully stay mostly out to open ocean here, not bringing much rain even toward Cape Hatteras. Uh, only one of the GFS ensemble members actually brings it over into um, you know, in, into North Carolina. So that would mean that of the 80 different, 80 or so different ensemble forecasts we have from the European and the GFS combined, only one of them actually makes uh, what, you know, what could be a stronger version of Henry come over toward um, North Carolina at this point. So we'll mostly right now keep the storm along the main track here, which follows the National Hurricane Guide, uh, National Hurricane Center guidance and keeping it out to open ocean. 
Okay, coming back to our National Weather Service All Hazards map, you can see they've extended the area over which they're concerned about flood, and that's the area we just talked about there. There's also flooding going on in southern Arizona and New Mexico. But much of what you see across the west is either heat advisory, excessive heat warning, parts of California, and then as you get up farther to the north, this is all red flag warning and also air quality issues. And so just taking a look here at what often starts some of those fires, we can go look at our current lightning uh, strike map. And it's interesting, a couple things here. We, we do have a lot of storms down in parts of the south, uh, you know, the, the Arizona, New Mexico, the southwest, and also moving across parts of the southern plains. But we do see that on the tail of, um, of uh, Fred, quite a bit of lightning in this, meaning we've got some, you know, relatively lower freezing levels, and there's also a lot of storms out ahead of this. So before Fred even gets there, we're going to be putting down quite a bit of rainfall in that area. We can maybe watch that by just going back here over the last couple of hours. We're going back in time. We'll go back forward here. You can see uh, kind of on this national view where Fred came in. But look at all the scattered convection out ahead of it and also in the southern plains of the United States. So this is going to be an area right in through here that I'm going to be very concerned about the threat of flooding as we progress through the next 48 hours or so. Next, I'd like to show you the latest update from the high resolution rapid refresh on smoke. And there is a lot of insight in this animation as to where the pattern is going to be changing. So let me play it for you. Right now the smoke extent across the western half of the United States is pretty large. But I want you to notice that as we go out in through the rest of the day today into tomorrow, do you see the shift in the smoke pattern? Let's just pause it there. Did you see how that was now? Let's go back maybe a couple steps. There you go. Do you see how it's coming out of the north and pushing over parts of, of Washington and the smoke that's coming from the fires in northern California? Uh, is kind of getting pulled into parts of Nevada. This is overall representing a pretty significant change, at least in the next couple of weeks, uh, of the North Pacific jet stream. And that change might be best defined by looking here at something called the Pacific North American pattern or Pacific North American oscillation, the PNA. Now, in general, if the values are above zero, we're talking about ridging events across the West, but when they're below zero, we're talking about troughing. And as you can see, the values over the next, well, possibly even here carrying into the end of the month, are largely going to be staying well below average. Now, there's a large spread in the forecast once you get beyond about eight days. But this is significant, and we need to see what this is going to do overall to the precipitation and temperature patterns across North America. So let's go look at it. And we're going to start off first with the jet stream level winds. Okay, watch this trough here, and watch there's another one behind it. Because as that first trough, by the time we get into tonight and into tomorrow, has now pulled here into parts of Oregon and Washington. So that's that smoke directional change I showed you. Then the models for the last three or four runs have attempted to do this, and that is to temporarily cut this low off, slowing its uh, forward progress. The main flow stays to the north, and that is why a week ago I would have said it would have already been storming Wednesday uh, here in the northern plains, but now with the slower progression of this, we're going to have to wait a little bit because it doesn't get picked up back into the main flow until we get toward the end of this week. Now the wave is open, it's got a tilt to it, and therefore we're going to have a lot of upper level support right in through here for a lot of storms and also a lot of possibly some pretty heavy rainfall. But notice another trough digs into the Pacific Northwest. And as that trough digs in here, that is yet another chance for something very similar to happen over the weekend. And you get it again here on Sunday. So this represents a pretty substantial near-term pattern change uh, for parts of the Pacific Northwest. And multiple uh, lows eject here out of the northern Rockies and move through the northern plains of the United States and southern Canadian Prairie. And of course, those are areas we've been discussing for quite some time that have been in exceptional drought uh, this year. So maybe a good way to summarize this up to this point is just to take a look at the European Ensemble and we're going to look at the next 10 days at the probability of getting an inch of rainfall. So this again is the probability of one inch of rainfall. So we've got Fred. We've got all this business over here coming from uh, Henry. This would be from Grace. This is the scattered convection we have over the south. Here it is coming up with our monsoon. And now those troughs kicking in and right in through here, that's a pretty high probability. That's 60 to 90% of getting some heavier rains. We are kind of dry in between. All right. And some areas I just highlighted there last week were exceptionally wet. Um, some locations picking up six to 10 inches of rain. Now, to put this all together, I want to look at two different modeling sources today. We're going to use the WPC, which blends together not only the European, but also the GFS and other models, plus human forecasts. And we're going to focus primarily on the European 
as it has done a better job at capturing this pattern. But what you've been looking at while I've been talking here is the next seven days from the 12Z initialization of the WPC. So we can see in this shading and through here those areas that have a good chance of getting more than an inch and a half of rainfall. And that includes the, the front that sags through the midsection of the country. So you can kind of see this whole area in through here. There goes Fred. And then the waves that excite here over the Rockies and pull right through parts of southern Saskatchewan, Manitoba into Ontario. And that, that's the main story. It's drier in the Midwest, upper Midwest, and Great Lakes. And you can also see that just because it's not the season yet, we're drying the western side of the United States as well. So to help put this into context, I want to at least bring the latest 40 centimeter soil moisture map. Again, this is the top 16 cent, uh, excuse me, top 16 inches of soil moisture. And one of the first things that I'm drawn to with that pattern is we are now increasing, oops, there we go. We're now increasing the chances of bringing in some rain onto some very, very dry soil. And that extends back here into parts of Montana as well. Now regions that will be to the south of this will likely see a drier uh, setup, although we could get that rain down here into parts of, of Nebraska as well. The drought issues we've had from parts of the Ohio River Valley and then right here in the Appalachian Mountains could also see quite a bit of rainfall coming out of this. So to see how this all unfolds, what I'd like to do next is I want to go over and look at the European model solution for all of this. So this is the 12Z run, came out after the markets closed today. And what we're going to watch first is just the next couple of days here. Now severe weather threat will largely be confined to what will be ahead of, of Tropical Storm Fred in through here. And we could get some isolated storms that overcross the parts of the south into tomorrow that could cause a problem. But again, you saw Fred kind of go right into this area. So I'm expecting a lot of flooding in the Appalachian Mountains. Scatter storms throughout uh, tomorrow, throughout the um, uh, you know parts of the Northeast and the Ohio River Valley, and here is the beginning of what's going to be a wet go of it right into this area. So again, this is through Tuesday evening. Let's keep adding this up though, going out to Wednesday morning, afternoon, and evening, and let's progress into Thursday as well. So I'm going to stop it right there. Now at this particular point, this is what's left of Fred, possibly bringing in some heavy rain into parts of Pennsylvania and New York. Our low is now cut off right in here from the main flow, which is pretty far to the north. So we could get some early rain here on a warm frontal boundary, but because that low is in place here, we're going to have good upper level support for storms right here on this part of the Rocky Mountains. Outside of that, we have scattered storms to the south, and there's a lingering frontal boundary sitting in there. Grace, by the way, is here by the time we get to Thursday morning. Okay, let's keep moving through Thursday afternoon and evening, and now working our way into Friday. Now at this point, higher pressures in control over the Great Lakes. There's a lingering frontal boundary in position here. Fred is out of the picture. Grace is right in through here. And now the wave that I told you was getting cut off is now getting picked up into the flow. And what that's doing is that's gonna increase rainfall chances in this corridor starting late in this week and then moving forward, ready? So this is Friday afternoon and evening, getting into the overnight hours. And this is now Saturday morning, afternoon and evening. Now that low cranks right through this area. And you can see that it leaves our frontal boundary here. And that did bring some storms into parts of the Western Corn Belt as well, as you saw here as we approach the end of this week and weekend. Now getting into next week, that's the next wave coming through. So there's another shot at rain for like the Red River Valley of the North as we get out into next uh, Sunday, Sunday night time frame. From here, we keep playing this forward, our next low comes in too. So this is that negative PNA pattern, keep sending these troughs on through the Pacific Northwest into the Northern Plains of the United States, looking all the way out here about a week from now. Now to go beyond that point, all right, what I wanna do is I wanna show you what the European model ensemble is doing with the jet stream pattern. So one week from now, here's our next trough that we're talking about. And as we progress through next Tuesday into Wednesday and Thursday, that trough continues to progress across the northern tier of the United States. So you can expect storms out ahead of it. That's what that's going to tell you. By day 10, we get to about right here. And then going beyond that, the models once again kind of rebuild the southwestern ridge all the way out to day, um, about day 14 or 15. I also noticed this coming out of Alaska by the time we get out to the end of the month is another trough here. And I think the pattern is remaining open as we discussed last week, unblocked, and it's going to keep moving. And as a result of that, we end up getting this precipitation pattern for week two. So this is day seven through 14, which gets us all the way out uh, to August the 30th. And once again, we do see a pretty sizable corridor here in the midsection of the country. And this does extend to the northeast of possibly an average rainfall, maybe even wetter than normal conditions. 
It is interesting to see that the models throughout day 15 are not picking up on tropical activity coming back in. So that's important to note as well. Although remember, these models struggle with initialization of those storms, especially as they're coming out of the main development region. So now we got two weeks of temperatures, or excuse me, precip down. Let's go talk about temperatures. I just continued to kind of be amazed at this map. This would be June 1st through August 15th, and we're looking here at precipitation ranks by climate district. Just a reminder, everything that's got a one in it would be the hottest such time period on record, and they go back to 1893. So the West has endured extremely high heat at times in June, July, and now the front half of August. It's caused high evaporation rates and really stressed crops in the Western US. We can see that by also looking at this figure. What I'm showing you here are called stress degree days. They're accumulated by kind of counting up the degrees above 86 every day and summing them up. And some research done by Dr. Ellen Taylor suggests that, especially for corn crop, if you get above 140 of them, you tend to stress the crop. So you've seen these before from me. I color code in green every location that's still below that 140 threshold. And you can even see the numbers on the figure. I put anything that is above 140 in red fading to kind of a white color or pink. And what this shows us is that the, 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 the central plains and north central plains have exceeded these values. And where it is less of an effect is where you have irrigated fields in parts of Kansas and uh, Nebraska, for example. But in North and South Dakota on that corn crop, there's been significant stress throughout this growing season coming from heat. And since we're talking about heat, take a look at what the forecast highs were today. That was another place where we saw triple digit heat extending from Western Nebraska through South Dakota and North Dakota getting back into Montana. But this whole area is about to go on a pretty wild ride in terms of temperatures as those troughs come in. And uh, while we're cooler here of the east, we're about to replace this whole pattern. You ready? So going into Tuesday and Wednesday, that's the trough digging in. So there could be places in Montana that throughout the beginning of this week see a 50 to maybe upwards of a 60 degree swing in temperatures. I'm talking from highs to lows. We're only looking at highs here. Those lows may get into the 40s for overnight lows in parts of Montana midweek toward the end of the week. Now it's still hot around the Red River Valley of the North and Upper Midwest, but we're gonna transition as we get into Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and bring in that cooler air shoving the warmer air back into the northeast. We'll take this all the way out to next Sunday, just as a stopping point here with the National Digital Forecast Database, and you get a lot of transition throughout this week. Now looking exclusively at day five through 10, this is what the 12Z European model was picking up on. So you see where we're gonna replace some of the cooler air here with a warmer shot of it out day five through 10, and we're gonna certainly bring in quite a bit of cooler air where it is exceptionally hot today in the Northern Plains and Southern Canadian Prairie. Now beyond that, we're gonna look at both models. This is the GFS first. Both models want to return warmth back to the Western United States by the time we get out to day 10 through 15. You can see it there in the GFS and here in the European. So this seems to be something the models are anchored to with bringing a ridge, at least in some sense, by the time we get to the end of the 15 day time period, erasing away this negative PNA pattern that we've had lately. Okay, at this point, I'd like to transition and talk to you about some longer range weather issues that I've been thinking a lot about. And the first is gonna be some verification. This is the last 30 days of precipitation uh, compared to normal. So we're basically going back to the 18th of July. Now in the midsection of the United States, there are a lot of places that saw some very, very heavy rain, but most locations, as you can see here, were drier than normal. A lot of places between 30 and 60% of their normal precipitation. Again, I'm talking about in the middle section of the country. Strong southwestern monsoon, and then pockets here in parts of the Great Lakes and Northeast, here in North Carolina, much of the Cotton Belt, have seen some very heavy rainfall. Now, how well was this predicted? So get a good look at this map, as I wanna take you back to the model runs done on the 19th of July and show you the forecast that's valid through this map, ready? You see, we saw here, whoops, sorry, let's try that again. There we go. This is what the forecast was. Again, verification and forecast. Now we've talked a lot about how the resolution of the models doesn't allow them to properly capture convective events. But you do notice that this is an area that the models had picked up on drier risks. We were gonna see storms over in the Great Lakes area, storms throughout the Cotton Belt, but it could have been drier around the Appalachian Mountains where it was here in Virginia and West Virginia. You know, I'm not into giving grades to the models because it's amazing we even have models that can attempt to do this. But you, you would say that overall, this was impressive that it was able to pick up on these things. 
But you're going to go, wait a minute, if I'm living in the midsection of the country, this was not good. There was a lot of dry spots in there. And I kind of come back to that idea that the model is incapable of picking up on convective events. And that's why I tell you when I look out here at these links that there's a lot of scattered storms in this area. It's what happens in summer, all right? Now, what's changing and how does it inform us on the forecast? The MJO is part of this. Over the next half of a month, much of the best rising motion stays between Africa and the Indian Ocean. And there's a lot of subsidence in the middle of the Pacific. So see the blue greens lining up here and the warmer colors lining up there. Now what that tends to mean, I don't know, we'll just come out here and look at the mean. Uh, if we have a lot of subsidence here, there's a lot of rising motion on either side of it, okay? And that means that we're gonna have to continue to watch very carefully the main development region here. We're gonna have to watch the Gulf in here and the Caribbean for tropical development. That's not going away because we're still, you know, basically about a month away from the peak of the hurricane season, at least 20, 20 days or so. So with that MJO, where is it going? Well, it seems to want to stall out somewhere over the Indian Ocean. It's still moving here, eventually over toward Australia. But while it's there, we're gonna get all that subsidence on the other side of the graph over by the Western Pacific Ocean. And that's why you saw in the previous maps where I expect to see the best rising motion. So what does that give us? That gives us this look for the month of September. Now again, I'm just gonna make a point here about two things. You see a lot of green on this map. That's consistent with the behavior of the MGO right now. It's consistent with the flow coming out of the North Pacific. And what it's gonna end up looking like is not wet everywhere. I'm gonna say it again, it's a lot of scattered thunderstorm development when you have this particular pattern set up. So some places are gonna to continue to get rain, but some of the local environments where we have really dry conditions, those areas, because storms feed on their local environment, are going to get missed. That's why we have that saying, all signs fail in times of drought. So I wanna watch that very, very carefully. One other thing, these long range models are incapable. They are not, it's not part of how they're designed to pick up on the, the things that would seed a tropical cyclone. All right, so we're not gonna see any of that captured in the model. From there, I wanna talk about ocean temperatures. This is an animation over the last month of those ocean temperatures. Look at what happened here, right off this part of you know China and Japan. Major overturning here of the ocean temperatures. Watch it again with me. But as you're keeping an eye on the change in this area, which is certainly gonna affect the jet stream level winds, okay? we do continue to see that our La Nina seems to be developing. And if we look, we get out there to where we currently are, this would be the South American side of this graphic, and this would be the Australian side of this graphic. And the line across the top is the Equatorial Pacific. This is going down below the ocean surface. It's a lot of cold water that's upwelling in this particular area. And that's why the long range forecast for the month of October keep this region with cooler anomalies. See that they're centered right in through here. Now I was looking at this graph and I wanna do a little comparison for you because our most recent October memory, of course, is last year. That's how it works. And when I saw this, I went back and I said, what did it look like a year ago when we were seeing the big La Nina start to develop? So a little different color bar here. So let me make sure that's clear, right? This one goes up to 10 degrees above and this one goes to minus 10. Our next one here only goes from minus five to five. So this looks a lot colder uh, and it is a little colder, but not much. But I saw a lot of warm water here and a lot of warm water there in the developing La Nina, all right? Now, when we saw that pattern last year, it was a major driver for our October weather. And again, we're seeing this setting up this year, and there are some similarities. Now, putting that all together, this is what happened last year. And what you've got in this particular map really shows you the temperature ranks, both average, max, and min, and also shows you what the precipitation pattern did. So now that we've had a chance to look at these maps and kind of take them in to remember what October 2020 looked like, which at times had some cooler weather coming through the Midwest, and we had some wetter weather in place here, but overall a decent harvest time period for many, um, we have to ask ourselves, what is it going to make this upcoming season look like? And is there something we can draw away from this? Because we did start to bring in the precipitation quickly here to the Northwest while California stayed quite dry. Just something to think about there, because... As I was looking out, this is, again, I want to show it to you. This is the September, October, November precipitation pattern as forecast by the European model. All right. So we see something kind of like what we saw last year, the wetter conditions entering the northwest first. Overall, you would call this a slight dry bias. I'm going to be clear here. 
This does not mean it's not going to rain. It just is a slight dry bias. We have had years in the past where high pressure has parked over the southeast, drying them out, and we've had ring of fire flow kind of around this in October, really soaking during harvest. Right now, the models aren't suggesting that, but it's a, it is always a possibility. And what's interesting, too, is I kind of go forward, sliding one month at a time, but looking at a three-month average here. We see that the models are really hung up on the analog idea of a La Nina, and that is early season wet weather here, cooler and wetter across the northern tier of the United States, warmer and drier across the south to the southeast. This is November, December, January, and keeping going here, December, January, February. And that is very much what La Nina patterns tend to look like. And so the models have bit into this pretty hard. But this would be the second dip into La Nina. And I don't think that this is going to verify very well. But we'll keep an eye on it and I'll report back to you, all right? Appreciate your attention. I'll talk to you again on Thursday. Thanks.